we're going to look at using integration and differentiation to represent functions as power series, if you couldn't read that yourself. Uh, we've talked about power series before and representing functions as power series, but sometimes you have to use derivatives or antiderivatives to achieve that goal. Uh, so before we do that, let's talk about how to differentiate or integrate a power series. I have a few examples of derivatives here. The one thing you need to keep in mind is when we're doing derivatives, we're doing the derivative with respect to x. That means x is our variable, n is considered a constant. So when I'm doing the derivative of this thing, anything that is not with the x is considered a constant. The only thing I need to actually differentiate for this is the x to the n power, and it's really not too bad because that's simply a power rule. The derivative of x to any power is you bring down the exponent, leave the x alone, and then you subtract one from the previous exponent. So I just did the derivative of x to the n, and then we just keep the rest of the series intact. Zero to infinity, and I didn't leave myself much room. There we go. So that would be the derivative of this series. Simply power rule the x to the n. Looking down at this one, uh, very, very similar, only instead of a, an x to the n, I put a negative x to the n. So we have a couple of options. We could do a chain rule, bring down the n, leave the inside alone, subtract one, and then multiply by a negative one. Uh, and that would work just fine, nothing wrong with it. However, some things in the future will be easier if we split that apart. And instead of doing the derivative as written, we rewrite the series as 3, and then instead of negative x to the n, we're going to break that up to negative 1 to the n and x to the n. So now when I differentiate it, I no longer have the chain rule. The x is only being raised to an n, and so that would again be n x to the n minus 1. So when I differentiate this, I would have the series 0 to infinity, uh, the 3 and negative 1 to the n will be left alone, and the derivative of x to the n is going to be n x to the n minus 1, and there is our derivative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one more, one more. Looking at this one, looks hairy, looks pretty bad, but remember x is the variable, not n. Do not try to do quotient rule on this thing. The only thing we're going to differentiate is the x plus 1 to the 2n. Now, I'm always looking for ways to use algebra to make my derivatives easier. For example, on this previous problem, I split up the negative x to the n. However, on this problem, while I would like to do that, you cannot do this. Please do not distribute the 2n. You cannot distribute exponents. Um, because that is x plus 1, there's really nothing we could do. We have to do the derivative as it's written. So this derivative, I'm going to keep everything the same that does not have an x in it. So n equals 0 to infinity negative 1 to the n, doesn't have an x, so I can just copy it down. n factorial is not going to be affected by the derivative. However, x plus 1 to the 2n, I would bring down the exponent, leave x plus 1 alone, and subtract 1 from the previous exponent, and we're done. So derivatives, not too bad. Just don't get suckered into thinking you have to do product rule or quotient rule in places where you don't need to. Now, I want to look back at, say, this first example and point something out to you, because sometimes you will see answers written slightly different. If you were to write out the series of this derivative, if I plugged in 0 for n, that would be 3 times 0 times x to the negative 1 power, which would just be a term of 0. Plus, if I plugged in 1 for n, that would be 3 times 1 times x to the 1 minus 1, or 0. If I plugged in 2 for n, 3 times 2 is 6 x to the 2 minus 1 will be x to the first. 3 for n would be 9x squared, and so on. And a lot of times it turns out that when n is equal to 0 for your original first n, you actually have a 0 term. It goes away, or it's irrelevant. So you will often see people choose to start their derivative where they have their first non-zero term. And in this case, that's when n is equal to 1. So it actually turns out that this derivative could also be written as the series from 1 to infinity and keeping the formula the same, 3n x to the n minus 1. Uh, and these are the exact same. This series right here is the same as this series. Uh, 
they're both perfectly acceptable answers. However, if you see these on a multiple choice test or on the multiple choice portion of the AP exam, sometimes the options will be starting at n equals 1, sometimes they start at n equals 0, and you have to know what's going on and why they are different than what you may have on your own paper. So let's move on and look at antiderivatives. Antiderivatives follow the same rules as the derivatives. When possible, I am going to split up and simplify my function, and I can do that with this first one. So I'm not going to do the antiderivative yet. I'm going to alter the way this problem is written. Not absolutely necessary, but it does make it a lot easier. So that would be 5 times, and 2x to the n could be written as 2 to the n x to the n dx and notice we're doing the, the antiderivative dx that means this is the only thing we're really concerned about so the 5 and the 2 to the n are not going to be affected by the antiderivative so that would be the sum n goes from 1 to infinity 5 times 2 to the n and the antiderivative of x to the n well, now it's the antiderivative, so that would be x to the n plus 1. We add 1 to our old exponent, then we divide by the new, and that would be the antiderivative. Uh, now, don't forget that when you do general antiderivatives, you do need to put a plus c. Uh, to avoid confusion, because if you write it just like that, it's hard to tell if the plus c is actually part of the series or if it's not, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. We don't want it to be inside the sigma, so to avoid that confusion, I often most people will put their C at the beginning, then it's painfully obvious that the C is not part of the series. Let's try this one. This antiderivative, again, I'm going to split that up. X divided by 5 to the n plus 1. We could rewrite as n goes from 1 to infinity. The 3 I'm not going to mess with. However, the X, I'm going to change that to X to the n plus 1 over 5 to the n plus 1. And again, that's not absolutely necessary. It just makes the integration a little bit easier. So this would equal some constant plus. And this would be n goes from 1 to infinity. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and write everything down that doesn't need to be messed with. So the 3 and the 5 to the n plus 1. Don't deal with an x. So now I need to integrate x to the n plus 1, which would be x to the n plus 2, we add 1 to the old exponent, and then, whoops, add 1 to the old exponent, and then divide by the new. So there is our antiderivative for number 2. I have one more example. This one, uh, again, looks ugly, has a quotient and all this mess, but remember, we integrate with respect to x. So uh, the only thing I'm going to integrate is the x minus 3 to the n, and you cannot simplify that because it's uh, addition or subtraction. So when I integrate this, that would be the sum constant plus the series. n is going to go from 1 to infinity. Negative 1 to the n and n factorial are not affected. Uh, however, x minus 3 will become, well, if I integrate that, because the inside derivative is 1, you can treat this like a big power rule. So that would be x minus 3 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And there's our answer for that one. So there's your integration and differentiation of power series. Now we're going to look at using that as a method to represent functions as power series. First one we're going to look at is the inverse tangent of x. If you remember the ones we looked at before, what we tried to do is to get your function to look like the sum of an infinite geometric series, which is your first term over 1 minus the ratio. That was what we wanted to do. Sometimes they're already in that form. Sometimes it just needs a little bit of small algebra to get to that form. This one, however, with algebra, you are not going to turn inverse tangent into a fraction like that. So what we're going to do is use our calculus skills, and hopefully you all know that the derivative of this function is 1 over 1 plus x squared, which is beautiful because in that calculus maneuver, I now have something that looks very much like the sum of an infinite geometric sum. Um, so to kill this dead, I could write that as 1 over 1 minus negative x squared, which could be written as the series 1 times negative x squared to the n power, where n goes from 0 
to infinity. Um, so that's my derivative. Well, I just found a power series for the derivative. If I want to work back to my original function, that means my function would be the antiderivative of that power series. Now, since I'm going to be doing the antiderivative, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. I'm going to write that as n goes from 0 to infinity. Um, the 1 is irrelevant, but negative x squared could be written as negative 1 to the n, and x squared to the n, um, which is still a little bit ugly. I'm going to rewrite that one more time as negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n. And you don't have to show it in, in such great detail. You may be able to go straight to that final form. Uh, so now we need to integrate that. So this antiderivative of this series, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n with respect to x would be some constant plus my series. It goes from 0 to infinity. Uh, negative 1 to the n is a constant, so I'm not going to worry about that. However, x to the 2n, we need to add 1 to that, 2n plus 1, and divide by the new exponent. And there is your power series representation for the inverse tangent of x. Try another one. Uh, f of x is ln of 1 minus x. Like arctangent, that's not written as a fraction, and algebra will not get you to that point. So we're going to channel our calculus skills, and hopefully you remember that the derivative of a natural log, in this case, would be negative 1, the derivative of the inside, over the inside. And that one's ready for a geometric sum. It's already a sub 1 over 1 minus r. So my first term is negative 1. My ratio is just x. So that would be written as the series n goes from 0 to infinity of negative 1 times the ratio to the n power. Pretty clean. We don't have to do any work with that. It's just an x to an n power, nothing inside there with the x. So I'm ready to find my function. f of x would be the antiderivative of that series, negative 1, x. Whoops, forgot the sigma. Wah, wah. There we go. And to integrate that, <coughs> power rule it. Zero to infinity. Uh, well, the negative one is not going to go anywhere. However, x to the n will become x to the n plus one over n plus one. And I forgot my plus c, so let me see if I can separate this stuff out. Oh, geez, what's going on here? Group, there we go. All right, so it's going to be some constant plus all of that. There we go. Uh, so there we go. There's two cases of using antiderivatives to get to your series. I mean, I guess we did both. We did the derivative and then the antiderivative to get back to where we started. Uh, if you look at this one, here we have f of x. Now, this one almost looks like it's ready to go. Remember, we're looking for something over 1 minus the ratio. That's our goal. Uh, this one, however, has a problem because it's the entire denominator squared, and there's no, mm, no real easy way to make this work with algebra. I can think of one way, but I honestly would not want you to use that method. So I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist. All right, so what we're going to do is try to use our calculus to get it to simply 1 minus a number. Uh, well, if you did the derivative, if you did the derivative of this, it would turn out that this derivative is negative 4 over 1 plus 2x quantity cubed. If you don't believe me, bring it up, make it to the negative 2 power, and do your power rule, um, or your chain rule. And if you notice, the derivative did not help me. It actually added to the exponent, where we really need this to be, like, if it were just 1 over 1 plus 2x, I'd be happy. But that squared is a problem. So what we're going to do in this case is we're actually going to find the antiderivative. And see, this was no good, no help. So now I'm going to go in the other direction, and I'm going to see what happens if I do the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus 2x squared, and see if that gives me something that's more desirable. And it turns out that when you do the antiderivative, you actually do get something that's very good. 
Uh, if you don't believe me, you can work this out, but there's the antiderivative. And I ended up with this right here being the antiderivative of my function. Well, this one's nice because that has a first term of, I thought I was green. I want this to be green. I have a first term of negative 1 half, and I have a ratio of negative 2x. So that means this thing, the antiderivative of my function, could be written as the power series. And goes from 0 to infinity of negative 1 half, negative 2x to the n power. So I have written the antiderivative as a power series, but now I have to work back to my original function. So if I, I have to undo the antiderivative I did, that means that my function, therefore, f of x, would be the derivative of that series. So the derivative of negative 1 half. And I'm going to go ahead and split this up. I have negative 2x to the n. I'm going to go ahead and change that to negative 2 to the n and x to the n. You want to separate that if possible. Makes it a little bit easier. It's not absolutely necessary, but just makes calculus easier. So we're going from 0 to infinity. <coughs> and it turns out that when you do that, the derivative is, well, we only have to differentiate the stuff that have, has an x with it. So that's the part I'm going to differentiate. So I'm going to leave everything else alone. So it's going to be the series. n goes from 0 to infinity, negative 1 half times negative 2 to the n. And then x to the n will become x to the, I'm sorry, whoa, almost to the antiderivative. So I'm doing the derivative here. Lock into the right mo method. Uh, so I would bring down the n times n x to the n minus 1. And there I finally have my power series representation for this function. So there's some tricks on using derivatives and antiderivatives to generate power series of functions.